I'm Madeline Lancaster and I'm a group leader in the Cell Biology Division of the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. I grew up in Utah in the United States and then I went for my PhD uh, training at the University of California in San Diego in the lab of Joe Gleason where I worked on cilia and Wnt signaling and development and adult homeostasis. I then moved to Vienna where I did my postdoc with Jürgen Knovich uh, where we developed these brain organoids or cerebral organoids for the first time. And then in 2015, I started my own lab here at the LMB uh, using these brain organoids to look at human brain development and evolution. My laboratory is focused on understanding uh, the human brain and what sets our brains apart from that of other mammals and other apes. So we're interested in human brain evolution and uh, looking at the cell biology uh, during early brain development that, that sets up our greatly expanded uh, brains. My father actually is a scientist, so I grew up with science around me all the time, to be honest. Um, but I remember visiting his lab a lot, actually, and um, I remember very vividly seeing, for example, his um, light box on his desk with all of his slides, uh, actual slides back then, you know, setting up his talks, and he would show me some of his exciting new findings. He was primarily a chemist. Um, so his lab was really exciting because it was full of lots of fancy chemistry equipment. But I, I remember very well going into the lab and looking in the microscope and seeing a neuron for the first time with him, and that really stuck with me. I became interested in the brain uh, also at a very young age because of my mother, actually, in this case, because she is a psychiatrist. And so um, I also would go with her sometimes to her work and, and sit in the waiting room and sometimes see some of the patients that she was, um, that she was treating, you know, patients with schizophrenia uh, or bipolar and really severe um, neurological conditions like that. And I think uh, that stuck with me. I, I always wondered how is it possible for, you know, us humans to have such um, rich cognitive abilities and yet, at the same time, be susceptible to these kind of horrific, sometimes, uh, disorders. And so I wanted to understand how the brain works, and hopefully that information might uh, give us some new treatments for some of those conditions. I think the question of how the human brain really is different than those of our closest living relatives, like chimpanzees and gorillas, is one that has been you know, asked for, for millennia, really. So um, I think some of our recent findings uh, really identifying a cell biological mechanism that helps explain how the brain actually expands in humans specifically is just is so exciting because it starts to really answer that question that really hasn't had any new uh, insight for, for a very, very long time. I think the most pivotal moment in my career really was the first time I looked through a microscope and saw brain organoids, what we would then call cerebral organoids, first forming in a dish. Um, realizing that we could actually make brain tissue in a dish and that we could then use it to start asking questions that were impossible previously. Uh, that really opened up a whole new uh, area of, of exploration for my lab and I think also others around the world. The experiment that was most pivotal in my career was also the experiment that actually did not go as planned. So I was actually not trying to make brain organoids when I did those experiments. We were trying to work with neural stem cells in a dish. We were trying to um, do sort of more um, typical kinds of experiments with cells cultured on, on standard petri dishes. And so uh, their formation of these three-dimensional tissues spontaneously was not expected, but very exciting. And from there, we then you know, went with it and continued to um, establish the methods to generate these tissues more reproducibly and to start asking these big questions. It's difficult to point to one person who has made a major impact on my career. I think it's really been almost like a team effort. I've had a lot of people that have influenced me over the years. I think my family, first of all, both my father and my mother being scientifically trained, that was a really important influence on my early life as a budding scientist. And then later in my, um, uh, in my education, my uh, PhD advisor, as well as my postdoctoral advisor, Jürgen Kronbeck, who really um, 
allowed me the freedom to uh, take on really exciting and um, challenging and risky projects um, that wouldn't have been possible in a lot of other laboratories, I think. Um, and then, of course, in my own laboratory as well, I have a really fantastic, um, supportive uh, group of colleagues who I turn to all the time for input here at the LMB. The LMB is probably the most special place in the world for scientific research. The freedom that we have here to ask um, questions that are often difficult to get funding in more traditional um, settings that require sort of more um, typical grant writing approaches and stuff. Um, that opens up areas of, of exploration that are impossible in most other institutes in the world. And having the freedom and the ability to really focus on the science without other sorts of distractions, especially in today's day and age where we have so much else going on besides, you know, just the science. And here I'm sort of um, buffered from all of that. And that is clearly having a very strong effect on the science in my lab and, and bringing it to new levels that I think would have been difficult in other places. I think a good scientist needs to be curious and creative. I think those are probably the most important two qualities. It helps to be smart, but I think that actually, um, you know, Einstein even said that creativity was one of the most important features, and I completely agree with that because you have to, uh, first of all, be curious and willing to explore um, uncharted territory, and then you have to be creative in order to uh, come up with new ways of interpreting the data in order to develop new hypotheses that are not necessarily a straight line from the observation. And I think those, those qualities uh, are really uh, what, have, what I've tried to, to nurture in myself and others in my lab as well. One of the biggest questions in my field, in the field of development, is what determines body plan organization, how it develops to become the size and shape that it is. And in particular, we're interested in the brain, so we want to understand how the human brain size is actually set up. But there's a more fundamental question there, and that is, what determines the developmental timing that sets up the size of the brain? Because it's all about timing at the end of the day. And that is a really big question that I'd like to answer in the future, I hope or at least uh, contribute to that uh, discovery in the future. I think at the end of the day, the questions we're asking are just so exciting to me that I, I can't really imagine doing anything else. I think a lot of people who are not scientists don't always know exactly what it is we do in the lab every day. And so the way I explain it to my family members is that I move small amounts of liquid from one place to the other over and over and over again. <laughs> And it might surprise people to know that that's actually what we do on a day to day. But at the end of the day, that's what biology really is, is on a small scale, looking at biological reactions and cells, you know, in their environment. And so, uh, I, you know, it doesn't sound that exciting, but at the end of the day, the questions we're asking, I think, are really big. I remember vividly my first paper. It was actually very difficult to publish. It took about two years uh, from the time we submitted to the time it got published. And in the process, a couple other papers that came out that kind of scooped it in different ways. And it was a really important learning experience. It was during my PhD, and uh, we were um, the, the study was focused on the role of uh, the primary cilium uh, in wind signaling in the kidney. And um, it ended up, uh, I think, being a very nice story that I'm really proud of, but it was uh, quite a learning experience. And I feel like after that, I still wanted to be a scientist. That's when I really knew that this is where I belong. <laughs> One of the most difficult things I think about being a scientist is um, actually just uh, keeping track of everything. There's so many new, exciting studies being published all the time. I have a hard time keeping up with it all because we're always, I think, my field and, and in the broader sort of biology field, there's always, uh, you know, a really exciting new paper coming out every single day and I can't possibly keep up with it all. So I think the hardest part is actually, uh, you know, keeping abreast of all the new and exciting technologies and findings and seeing how it fits in with the work that we're doing in my lab.
There's a few things that I think the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has made me rethink a little bit. Um, first of all, um, I'm rethinking a lot of the travel that we used to do to conferences and things like grant review panels and things like that. I think that um, also, you know, even before COVID-19, I was trying to be more aware of my, co or of my uh, carbon footprint, for example. And um, I think now I'm realizing that we don't need to do all that traveling. And the, the world is very connected actually virtually. And I think we should uh, nurture that more in the future and keep that up because that's going to be better for us as a planet as well. I hope that since the outbreak of COVID-19, people have changed their opinions of science to some degree. I hope that people have realized how much science has given us. We have several very successful vaccines now, and that's all thanks to a very rapid, you know, movement in science, um, sharing data, you know, making sure that the sequences were available for the virus very, very early on. Um, and then joining forces, uh, you know, academia, industry, joining forces to make these vaccines. I hope that the public is now, you know, has faith in the scientific community that we are working uh, for the better good. Most of my research is pretty fundamental, meaning we're asking really basic questions about biology, about, you know, human brain development. But some of our research, I think, can have uh, important impacts um, in you know, patients' lives in the future. It's hard to predict exactly where they will, you know, where it will go. But you know, for example, um, CRISPR was also a, an area of fundamental biology. Scientists interested in, in bacterial um, responses to bacteriophages, to viruses, um, without really knowing whether it would have an impact in you know, people's lives. And now, of course, we have some of the first um, uh, clinical treatments based on CRISPR. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that some of our basic discoveries will also lead to new insight into human disease in the future. I have a lot of um, hobbies and things I like to do other than science. Um, some of them I can do here but in Cambridge, but some I can't. So, for example, I love skiing. That's a bit difficult in Cambridge, but that's okay. I'll go, I go home every now and then and try to go skiing back home in Salt Lake City. Um, and I really like to paint, actually. I'm not very good at it, <laughs> but I enjoy uh, doing a bit of artwork at home as well and expressing my own creativity. My scientific career has definitely been different than what I expected. I think when I started out, um, you know, and I knew I wanted to be a scientist, I thought that I would just be sort of in a lab somewhere, working away day and night, not really talking with people, just kind of doing the experiments. And I was actually happy to see that so many people, non-scientists too, are also very excited about the work that we're doing. And I really enjoy telling the public about it. I enjoy interacting with, at various public outreach events and, and telling people about our work. So I think that was something that was unexpected, but I'm very happy with. I think if I had to give some advice to somebody just starting out as a scientist, I would say that um, the most important thing to remember is why you're doing science in the first place. Um, for most of it, most of us, it is because of that curiosity and to remember that feeling, you know, when you discover something new for the first time uh, in your own experiments. And so even though there are difficult times when things aren't working or, you know, when uh, you've been working on a project for a long time and somebody else succeeds when you haven't, um, try to remember uh, that wonderful feeling when things do go your way and you do make a really interesting new discovery. And even the tiniest little discovery, I think, uh, is important. And so to, to, to remember that that's why we're doing this. I think that uh, if I can achieve one thing in five to ten years, it would be something that I can't predict, actually. I think that the, the best, I'll be in the best place in five to ten years if I've done something that I couldn't possibly have predicted. Because my, my own experience has taught me that the really great discoveries are things that you can't necessarily plan for. Uh, because if it was, if you could plan for it, then it's probably not a really big step. 
So I'm hopeful that we can do something like that in the next five, 10 years.